Ladies and gentlemen, Hans, it's a great honor. Thanks for trying with my last name. It's a great honor to be back. <laughs> I missed last year, unfortunately, but I have spoken almost every year here, I think. And interestingly, I think it's the first time as an Austrian, Austrian economist that I actually get to speak about economics. So let's see how that goes. Probably I'll go back to history next, next year. <laughs> um, Let's, let's start by as competitive as we economists are. Let's start by taking fold with another Austrian, Austrian economist. Uh, of course, I'm only a dwarf on the shoulder of giants. You all know that. Uh, but let me take some issue with the giant Friedrich August von Hayek. Uh, now, poor old Hayek has got quite some kicking here already. So let me try to soften the blow uh, a little bit. Um, he may have just been the innocent victim of a law of nature that you all know, Rothbard's law. Uh, if you don't know Rothbard's law, it states that uh, people, in particular economists, tend to specialize the thing they are worst at. Now, as an even a tiny dwarf on the shoulder of giants, let me try to critically improve upon that law a little bit. Uh, I think we have to generalize it a bit to make it a better fit for Hayek. Uh, and uh, I propose a generalization of Rothbard's law. And that's uh, economists tend to get the most mainstream acclaim for the things they are worst at. I think that holds true for almost every case. Uh, so I think it's a good, a sound generalization. Uh, Hayek is most famous as one of the biggest neoliberals and a strong influence on the older liberals. And the older liberals are known for the greatest thinkers on competition. And in particular, they assume uh, that competition is the essence of a market economy. Now, I think that that thought is dangerously misleading. Of course, uh, you have all learned from Hans Hoppe that competition can't be a good per se. It's all about who is competing about what. Uh, and as Hans has put it much more eloquently than I can, frequently it's the competition of crooks competing about how to best defraud and plunder all of us. But Hayek's argument is not an ethical one. It's an epistemological one. And I'll try to dissect the epistemology of competition a little bit. His most famous lecture on the topic is competition as a discovery procedure. Of course, hence my tongue-in-cheek title of this talk. Um, I simply don't buy it. Uh, and let's start with uh, reading some uh, of Hayek's thought. Uh, so I, I don't like uh, to read when speaking, but uh, I think it's best to, to cite him uh, as his writing, not in the same chronological order, but let's see. Uh, Hayek writes uh, in this, or he spoke in this famous speech, which was let, later written down, competition is important only because and insofar as its outcomes are unpredictable and on the whole different uh, from those that anyone would have been able to consciously strive for. And then he gives famous examples in sporting events, examinations, the awarding of government contracts, or the bestowal of prizes for poems, not to mention science, it would be patently absurd to sponsor a contest if you knew in advance who the winner would be. Therefore, I wish now to consider competition systematically as the procedure for discovering facts, which, if the procedure did not exist, would remain unknown or at least would not be used. Now, examples are great to understand something, but there's always a big risk with examples. Uh, they can be analogies that are misleading, and I think that's the case here. So that's like the first slide, the softest criticism. Let's look at the examples, sport events. Uh, now, I think if Austrian soccer fans really would be watching soccer because they wanted to find out if the team is winning, they would long have given up watching soccer matches in Austria because they almost never win. Uh, so I, I don't buy it that that's the reason. Uh, in particular, sport events are games, so they are not means to an end. They are ends in themselves. We enjoy competing with other people in games, and we enjoy watching other people compete if we have ties to them, if there's some shared identity, if you're rooting for them. That's fun. It's a common experience. I get it. I usually don't engage in it, but at least I get it. I don't get the discovery thing here in sport events. Uh, 
and of course in games. And there, I think, is something misleading in the analogy. What is uh, the defining feature of a game? It's rules, and usually it's arbitrary rules. Everyone gets the same goal. It tends to be an arbitrary goal, of course. Uh, it can be who's the fastest. It can be a beauty contest. And a beauty contest as a race are two examples of the same category. Uh, and, and the thing, of course, Hayek refers to, um, and I think they're very, very far away what a market is about. It's not about one rule that we get. Uh, and I think that lends to some misunderstanding of Hayek here. Now, one of the harshest criticism he gets uh, from the mainstream is even though he's such an important think on competition, it sounds awfully like some neo-Darwinist neo thought. And that, of course, is politically incorrect and impossible uh, to think along these lines. Uh, I think there's a misunderstanding about uh, what evolutionary theory teaches, but uh, Hayek is at least guilty in providing some bad analogies that lead along the line. Now, the bigger misunderstanding about Darwinism is that it's about survival of the fittest in a wrong kind of meaning, in that the fittest is a kind of physical fitness, that's an objective criterion, and that the fittest means it's a maximization along one line which of course is not at all what happens in evolution. In evolution, we have adaptations and acceptations that usually emerge in uncovered uh, ecological niches. So it's a process of differentiation. It's not an arbitrary red race about who is the fittest, the fastest, the strongest, the mightiest. And usually it's not a binary category. It's marginal, marginally higher propensity uh, to have surviving uh, uh, children if, uh, or descendants, uh, uh, and usually you get that by finding a new niche that, uh, is, is, that has been empty, that hasn't been yet filled. And uh, I think it, it, it lends itself to an approach to, to market processes, but it's not the way that with these particular examples you start thinking uh, along. Um, and, of course, obviously, it leads to hold the whole wrong idea of monopoly theory. Uh, and I think Rothbard is best here in really figuring out what it's all about. It's this wrong conception of competition uh, in thinking like uh, uh, it's very artificial, that something is unique about the company, they should all be alike and compete who's the cheapest, for example. One arbitrary rule, which comes from materialistic thinking, of course, that it's all about being either the cheapest or the most profitable, like, keeping the most money uh, to yourself, uh, which of course can be, we are free to do so, but there's nothing deterministic in human action that leads us uh, to follow that. Uh, and the examples Rothbard, of course, gives, gives for that kind of monopoly. Because he's like, if you look at an industry and you say, oh, the company has a large market share, it's probably a monopoly. It's the same as claiming that the corner store has a monopoly at the corner it's based at. Of course, if you have differentiation, everyone has a kind of unique monopoly. We are all one person, unique. We offer unique products and services, and we are free to discriminate uh, as consumers and savers. Uh, and uh, so I, I think it's this whole line of thinking about the market as a flat earth field for competing similar people on similar grounds along similar lines that led to this whole industry of competition policy and competition law and competition theory. Uh, and again, there's a bit high is at fault in being imprecise and somehow wrong about the actual entrepreneur, what the entrepreneur is like. Many of his texts make it seem like an entrepreneur discovers something that's already there. So it's just really good at, at, at looking at things and, and finding something new. Whereas uh, Mises, uh, I think, has the much sounder understanding of it. Uh, it's the promoter. Now, of course, the term promotion hasn't aged that well. Now it's mainly marketing. But what he meant is from the Latin promovens, someone who really brings about something new. It's not that it's, it, it's there and no one has seen it. Usually those kind of businesses fail where you assume that no one is seeing it. Uh, it's actually changing something and bringing it about. Uh, and that gets missed in this idea of competition. And now, interestingly, someone with practical experience in investment and uh, entrepreneurship has exactly came, uh, come to the same conclusion that was Peter Thiel, uh, uh, first in his uh, notes on startups and then in his book, uh, Zero to One, 
uh, that's exactly his experience. Uh, what he writes, and uh, I cite him, is competition is overrated. Competition may be a thing that we are taught and that we do unquestioningly. Maybe you compete in high school, then more tougher competition in college and grad school, and then the red race in the real world. And uh, what he says is the really valuable businesses are actually monopoly businesses. Uh, uh, of course, not uh, in the sense of having a privilege, but they are the last movers who create value that can be sustained over time instead of being eroded away by competitive forces. That's what usually in the startup world you call a moat. Uh, you want to find something that you are uniquely capable of providing uh, and you don't just want to copy. Of course, cop there's nothing bad about copying. Uh, it's what he calls the one-to-n kind of entrepreneurship. Uh, of course, once people know what's a smartphone, you can try to provide them with smartphones, and then it's a kind of see who gets the largest market share. Uh, but coming up uh, with the new concept uh, and idea is the much more important uh, innovative process. Uh, and uh, that really hasn't, or, or the, the mental model of competition is misleading. It's like looking at the competition uh, and usually it's not a good idea as an uh, entrepreneur. Uh, it's better to focus on what you are uniquely capable of providing and doing rather than looking at what everyone else is doing. Uh, and uh, in the symptom, I think you can see it in underdeveloped economies. Uh, uh, let me give you the example uh, that you see many places uh, on the planet. Uh, you see like five melon stands next to each other. And now this, uh, uh, I think, wrong approach to the market would say, oh, great, uh, a sixth one, a sixth melon stand will be more competition. And five are better than one. So it's more market competition, more markets. Uh, and I think that's untrue. Usually, there's nothing bad about having a fifth or a sixth uh, melon stand uh, uh, as an honest occupation, but it's a symptom of an economy and society where differentiation hasn't happened that much. And usually there are reasons for that. It's the symptoms of interventionism. It's people not being able to build up something new, people not being able to dissent uh, in a meaningful way and trying out something new, uh, because differentiation, of course, takes time and it takes uh, a monetary integration and useful protocols to cooperate in a more complicated differentiated structure. And if you don't see that, if you see like everyone doing the same or the kind of bizarre economy that we tend to see now sometimes as tourists, uh, where, like everyone tries to sell you the same thing and they just compete on the price, looks like a great competition. No, of course, it's a symptom of failing markets, of interventionism in market, of very short-term orientation, usually very high time preference. Who gets away with scamming the most, of figuring out how you can scam the most? Uh, uh, the naive tourists that new ones will come, those that have been there, they've learned the experience, and let's wait for the next uh, cruise ship uh, to come and try our luck anew. So I, I think it's this whole uh, wrong conception about markets uh, uh, that gets it all wrong <laughs> uh, the other way. Uh, there is another reason why competition is not always good and that has led to a lot of confusion among economists, uh, in particular the seemingly brightest economists, and that's the aspect that they tend to call network goods, uh, which I think is an inflated concept of course, but there's one crucial insight from reality is a lot of our preferences of course depend on what other people prefer as well. And we learn from other people and we like to do things with other people. And of course, that I enjoy this conference depends very much on you enjoying the conference. And it would m make no sense whatsoever that each of one would start now competing uh, with our 100 property and freedom societies here and everyone enjoying being the king uh, like Hans. Uh, because, of course, there's a natural monopoly in being Hans Hermann Hoppe. Uh, so it's, it's, it's no way an improvement uh, to see that as a kind of competition emerging. Of course, a conference is a network good in that sense, but I think it's an inflated term for something that so should be obvious for anyone. And it leads to things like looking at Facebook and claiming, oh, everyone has to be in Facebook in order for it to be a valuable service. So it must be a public utility. It's a natural monopoly and whatever kind of term you want to invent to publish your economics paper. And uh, what actually happens, I think, uh, is that way. It's like when the, the least cool and the most idiotic people join Facebook, it's like, oh, everyone else is already there. Uh, and who are the least cool, most idiotic people? Economists sometimes. So when the economists enter Facebook, it's like, oh, 
Everyone is already there and they don't see that they enter it exactly at the moment in history when Facebook is losing market share because your parents are already on Facebook. It sucks. Oh, economists are already on Facebook. It sucks so much and so hard. Uh, and then of course you go on. So you see it as a problem exactly at the moment when it disappears as a problem. It's never been a problem <laughs> uh, to begin with. And I think it comes from this lack of really like uh, real experience and understanding what it's about, why some preferences are shared rep preferences and why there's a lot of intersubjective coordination along our preferences. Uh, and uh, I think some uh, networks are more important uh, than others and I consider even Catalexy what Mises and Hayek called the extended order of cooperation. The market obviously is a network phenomenon. Uh, so I, I don't think it makes much sense and there's this argument like going around, oh we can't be sure that socialism in every possible flavor we can imagine will fail. Maybe it hasn't been tried hard enough. Let's compete with the market economy and try again and again and again and somehow we then can discover finally why the market is maybe superior or not. Uh, and I think it's the same fallacy. It's like you won't improve, uh, um, you won't find any, out anything by separating a network that has to be a network uh, by like cutting off people, usually by coercion from this network, claiming that, oh, I have to figure out uh, if it won't work better. Uh, so it's as crazy as like have a government instituted many of a thousands different Facebooks uh, that are government mandated for every preference and every kind of filter bubble gets its own protected space and safe space uh, uh, to be in. Uh, so I think you see there's lots of potentially very misleading ways you can go from very simple examples uh, which are wrong and wrong analogies. Uh, and I think it's worse than that. It's not just a scientific misconception. It's actually a cover-up. It has turned into a cover-up, not a discovery. So it's nothing that we can really find out uh, by pursuing that line of thought. I think it has become a cover-up story. And uh, let me tell you why that's the case. Uh, if we use, let's start again with the simplest thing. You look at a sports event and it's a great story. It's a great cover story. What are sports events a cover story for? For someone to organize it. You need organizers. Oh, great! That means we need committees of people organizing things. Oh, great! That means we need functionaries. Well, I mean, someone has to decide on the rule. How do you define a woman in women's sport? You need really, like, uh, certified functionaries being able to figure out the rules that you're all competing. Without that, there won't be a competition. So the whole idea of organized competition of course, lends itself to a class of functionaries that are now competition experts and competition functionaries uh, trying to figure out how to better compete. Uh, and even worse, now the next example or, or the third example was like prizes, awards, handing out prizes. Uh, and uh, now I, I think uh, <laughs> there's, there's a, a, a gaping flaw here. Uh, of course, Hayek was the recipient of such a prize. Uh, and uh, I'd find it quite ridiculous to assume that like, uh, people were looking all around the world, who is the best economist to find? And then it was a miraculous discovery. And they found Hayek and they gave him the prize. And it was just a discovery process. Uh, now, not saying, not claiming that, that uh, uh, um, uh, Hayek was a shill or anything, but I think it makes much more sense to look into prices and what they may be a cover-up for. And more generally, the big question is, of course, who pays for the price, who hands out the price. And, and you can't just be that formalistic as Hayek sometimes is just looking at the formal part of something. Uh, Guido talked about it, the legal structures, the formal structures, and look, look at the intent of it. And of course, it feels great handing out prices. That's the good thing about philanthropy. Everyone loves that. Everyone wants to be Bill Gates and handing out millions and billions to people and get all the acclaim. So by handing out prices, I think the biggest goal that you reach as a functionary is you've got to feel like a Renaissance patron. And you get to patronize scientists and poets and literates and you can bask in 
but glory of all the people you give prizes to. Uh, and of course, let, let's look at, at the Nobel Prize, which is quite obviously, obviously a cover-up, um, uh, this fake prize. And, and to, to admit, I mean, Hayek uh, was really one giving the best acceptance speech yet. Uh, it was an acceptance speech. Of, uh, I think it's a bad idea to hand out that prize, which I think is the best way to uh, uh, deal with uh, receiving a, a prize like that. Uh, why, why did he get the prize? Now, of course, there's conspiracy theories. It's all satire. We've all had the disclaimer. <laughs> What's the conspiracy? I think it makes much more sense to see, like, who was funding the prize? The Swedish Central Bank. What is their most likely aim? To institutionalize economics as a scientific uh, a discipline akin to physics and engineering with all the prestige that comes along. And if you read what Nobel wrote about the price, you can see him up turning in the grave. That's exactly what he did. He would never have agreed to handing out prizes to social scientists because, I mean, he rightfully uh, was wary about their methodological soundness uh, because most really are pseudo-scientists and are just abusing the cover of science uh, for very worldly interests. Uh, uh, so I think that's the main intention of the prize. Uh, uh, why did Hayek get it? I think it makes best sense to look at who else got it. Gona Myrdal, the welfare state totalitarian from Sweden. And at the time, it seemed like a very extreme guy to receive a Nobel Prize. So it makes a lot of sense if you need a cover-up story to be a very neutral body handing out prizes, of course, never to extremists, uh, because that's not what prizes are for. Uh, You've got to find someone from the other part of the spectrum to show how neutral you are, how it's all about the science, of course, and the facts will speak for themselves and that stuff we got to trust in. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's much more likely to think along these ways. Uh, of course, you can consider that a conspiracy uh, theory, uh, but then, I mean, let's entertain the other thought. Uh, and I think it's absurd, like assuming that there was a worldwide search for the most peaceful guy on the planet and miraculously, they discovered this immaculate person of color in Washington, D.C. with the audacity to hope. Doesn't make sense, a discovery procedure. It rather looks like a cover-up procedure, right? Um, so I think this example really doesn't uh, hold uh, uh, that well. And, of course, what's the most important cover-up story? And that's the basis of how order liberalism is perceived as competition as a rationale for interventionism. Uh, as always, <laughs> stay looking for reasons to intervene someplace. Uh, and it's always a problem. Oh, we should have a company there that's doing that and compete there. And why don't we have someone competing in that field? It's, it's this whole uh, thought process uh, of uh, propping up something. Of course, it lends itself to infant industry uh, argument, to favoritism of every kind, uh, and functionaries thinking about who should compete in which industry and, and, and which field, and it's really ridiculous. Uh, and that, of course, uh, explains why the famous neoliberals like Walter Lippmann, uh, one of the originators of the term, uh, in his agenda of liberalism, he, uh, uh, he uh, proposed measures such as drastic inheritance taxes, steeply graduated income taxes, and the financing of public work projects, and he cited approvingly Keynes. Of course, everything to increase competition, because that's apparently what markets are all about. Uh, uh, and uh, I'd say it's a flawed story. Competition, bring more business, that's a very Keynesian thought in itself. Like functionaries, politicians, thinking about more business. That's Keynesianism in its essence. Uh, someone thinking about more business who's living, of course, off the results of that business and just wants to uh, uh, plunder the, the cattle he's farming, um, uh, essentially. Uh, but Hayek was right on one thing on, on, in this particular speech. Uh, he realized something, and, and quite a, uh, I think that's quite important. When you look for the more, we need more competition. That's why we do economic policies that lead to more business, because more business is great, uh, uh, and, and, and the merchants will be forever thankful for our great four-sided policies. Uh, uh, Hayek observes that the high growth rate is more a sign of bad policies in the past than of good policies in the present. Why is that the case? Of course, <laughs> if you suddenly have high growth rates, usually it means catch-up growth. 
This means you w weren't able to do the most simple things like having a melon stand. And then, of course, once you are allowed to sell on the market, oh, you'll have suddenly five and ten melon stands. And it's a great thing. But it's not like, oh, we got more business by uh, have, having such a competitive policy. It's just all the interventionism uh, and flawed and blundering in the past that have led to all this upside potential for <laughs> uh, growth uh, and more business. Um, and, uh, well, of course, politicians arguing for more competition. I mean, how ridiculous can you get? It's like prostitutes arguing for more virginity. Uh, sorry, uh, that analogy, but they are good analogies and they are bad analogies, of course. Uh, so, obviously, competition policy is an oxymoron. <laughs> what is there less competitive than politics? It's exactly based on the idea that no one should compete, that it should be mon monopoly providers. Uh, so, it, it's really ridiculous if you look at it. Uh, and, uh, of course, it explains a lot of that mainstream economics models, like the perfect competition. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, let's kind of have perfect competition, which of course is an illusion. It's, it's the equilibrium model. That's called perfect competition. What does perfect competition mean? No change, no entrepreneurship, no money. Like everything that's interesting about economics, you cut it off and you call it perfect competition. I would call it castrated economics. Uh, or, or maybe uh, to have a fancy term, it's not catalectics, it's castralactics. Why is castration, I mean, it's the sign of the slave, of the cattle that you're farming. And I think that's what it's about, actually, that kind of, oh, we've got to have more business. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, um, and that's how you arrive at, at these uh, thoughts. Uh, of course, it all is a cover-up to overlook the essence, the real essence of the market uh, and its consumer and save us sovereignty. Sovereignty of people to say no to being castrated, branded as cattle, or whatever. Uh, uh, you would say it's no determinism. We are all free to discriminate as sovereign consumers or savers and not follow deterministically and go for the cheapest offer or uh, the same offer for everyone uh, that will uh, eventually end up like a competition. A competition end result is, of course, the one, the best company gets all the consumers and then, of course, that then socialism wouldn't look that extreme because it's already happened. That was the Marxist idea. Uh, and of course, it's very closely aligned to the kind of thought that competition means like one big fish eating all the other fish because one company will remain and survive on the planet. And then we just have to change uh, uh, the, the stockholders. We just move it on to everyone. Yeah, that's like the idea how without violence you'd have socialism, of course, based on, on fallacious things. Uh, and no basis in reality. Uh, what else is it a cover-up? Uh, of course, the whole distorted market structure that we are living in. The Green New Deals, the competition for subsidies. That's all competition. Of course, we are not socialists. Of course, we are not planning anything. We are offering market incentives. And then you've got to compete like throwing peanuts to the monkeys. Come up now with some green technology, you guys. I'm throwing out the peanuts, uh, compete for it, and that's our market economy in the uh, European Union, uh, throwing out peanuts uh, to get a greener uh, economy, which of course would mean much more business for every one of you. Uh, if consumers don't go for it, then we have all the subsidies here and all the credit uh, uh, you can ask for. And unfortunately, it really, uh, in Austria, I experience it daily, a startup sometimes really just means competing for subsidies. It's figuring out how to fill out the forms to compete for a subsidy. Sometimes they are called prices, sometimes they are preferred credits, uh, but it's a very artificial and interventionist thing, this kind of competing for the price from the emperor or, uh, or no doubt the bureaucracy that's handing it out. Uh, and another idea it leads to is, of course, the world is flat level playing field of globalism. It's like competition as a level playing field. How crazy can you be? The reality, of course, is a rocked landscape. And that's a great thing about a market uh, and its differentiation. It has to be a rocked landscape where we are free to say no. And that's why you have our niches and not a one-size-fits-all solution where the one big globalist uh, 
conglomerate now uh, gets it uh, to give it out to everyone and you don't even pay it for free uh, because it's such such great scaling uh, solution uh, and epistemologically uh, it leads or it's a sign of nihilism I think uh, and you hear it a lot like let the market decide uh, of course, there's something good about it, but I think something dangerously misleading. It can be a sign of relativism, a sign of nihilism, of saying, I have no clue. Let's not argue about it. Let's just let the market decide if socialism is better than capitalism. Uh, and uh, I would warn against uh, this kind of relativism. Of course, the good thing about let the market decide is uh, no one should have the power to impose anything, anything. But I think we have a duty to be honest and saying when we think that something is stupid, fraud, looks fraudulent or looks like a scam uh, or it's only there because of subsidies uh, and so on and it's not a sustainable business model, I think there's a moral duty to call out those competitors uh, and not just say let the market uh, uh, decide uh, it. Uh, so. I mean, I, I, I mentioned the phrase like, don't argue, build. Uh, and there's something great about it. Of course, we are all tired of the political bickering. But the don't argue, build gets something entirely wrong. And I recommend those people using the line to read Hans Hoppe and the real argumentation ethics and figure out it can't be the opposite. It can't be don't argue, but build. It can be don't just argue, maybe. But building necessitates, of course, to use resources in a different way than they have been used. Without that, you can't build. It necessitates to have a different idea about what the world should look like and how the resources should be employed. And of course, that's the essence of argumentation. If I use my vocal cords to express a different idea, a dissenting idea, it's usually just a step before using other resources to express different ideas about how things should go and should work out. So it can't be the opposite. And real building always necessitates a kind of dissent. And that's why this kind of nihilism is like, oh, let's not argue because you could hurt the feelings of that person there. Uh, let's all agree on everything. I, I think that's, that's like the level playing field of idiots where no one disagrees and everyone goes along. It's, it's not even worth discussing. It's not even worth arguing because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Ideas don't matter. Uh, it's just uh, uh, a, a matter of who's more successful in the competition. Um, and uh, I think that's the most dangerously misleading uh, idea here. Uh, let me, I, I think I have a little bit more time because it's quite a, a spacious speaking slot. Uh, uh, I'll uh, try to give you some, some uh, insights from an industry I've been watching uh, for quite a while. I, I uh, happened about it quite early on um, and I've be, become a bit of an industry inside I'd say and that's the crypto field, the cryptocurrency sector. Uh, and what I've seen is a lot of this narrative competition as a cover-up story. And let me explain how that happens. Uh, now, usually, if you say, uh, let the market decide and the new and competition is great and more competition is better, usually you mean that the new entrant on the market is great because it's new. That's what you mean by, if you have a new company, you, you, you don't want to say, okay, I, I, I don't think it's a good idea. You just say, oh, it's new. It must be, that's great, that's more competition. And I think, of course, that you have like intrinsically kind of progressivism built in, uh, and I don't think that's usually true. Uh, if you look at something and you realize, oh, cryptocurrency, I've never heard about it. That's entirely new. That's fantastic. I got to be early. It's a very, very misleading approach to investing and it usually will go wrong because if it's so new to you it means you have no clue because most innovation is not an invention most innovation is the recombination of things so if it's really new to you you have missed decades of inventions and technological progress uh, and bitcoin the first contender of course was a recombination of fairly old inventions there was nothing entirely new about it if it was all new to you it meant you had no clue uh, and of course, for some, it was a very great uh, heuristic, which usually doesn't work. Uh, but those who entered Bitcoin because they thought, oh, it's new, I have no clue, it must be something great, I can be early, 
they lost everything usually because then of course something else that's newer comes along and since Bitcoin 23,000 newer and shinier cryptocurrencies have come along. So 23,000 possibilities to be early again. Uh, the average uh, expected value, of course, is, is largely negative. Uh, I'm not saying they're all flawed uh, uh, projects. Of course, there's a lot of experimentation and that's what invention is about. But why are they sold as cryptocurrency? And I think uh, one of the reasons is uh, competition as a cover-up story. And even here, Hayek has contributed a misleading thought that it's uh, one of his most famous booklets or papers, the denationalization of money. Now, he, he was brilliant in the insight that you've got to separate the money and the state. Brilliant insight, very important. And I really like the paper because it's very unusual for an economist. It's like not him saying how, how the world should be and because he understands everything. It's like he's thinking, if I was an entrepreneur, how would I do it? That's wonderful. I think it was mostly wrong, his paper, but for all for the right reasons. Uh, still, of course, why, why is he wrong? And I think there's something about technological, uh, uh, how technological innovation process works. Uh, uh, Hayek thought that international businesses would become impossible to the fiat monies uh, because you have the currency risk. Uh, uh, and then, of course, he thought there's a problem. You've got to have a competition for a solution. And he thought maybe a company will come up with the right way to offer something better. But what he's looking here is a protocol uh, innovation. And it usually does not happen that way, that it's a startup that figures out a new protocol and then gets to reap all the benefits by becoming a unicorn. That's not how new technologies usually enter the markets. Usually the early startups in the new technology don't get to reap uh, the benefits of the introduction of the new technology. That's a harsh lesson to take. Uh, uh, there's nothing bad in being a startup and trying out something new, of course, but that's not how innovation usually works. Uh, uh, so it's not one company offering a one size fits all solution usually. Uh, it's more of a discovery process. Uh, and um, what was the solution? It was, of course, derivatives and hedging the whole financialization, which you can say is a market solution to an interventionist problem. But of course, this kind of competition that came up with a solution to a problem created by interventionism is a great cover up for the financialization <laughs> and the beneficiaries of the intervention and the monetary distortions in the first place. So it, become, it has become a great story. Uh, what was the, the actual uh, uh, potentially entrepreneurial solution? Um, and it works in a sense, but it's a very unjust distribution uh, of, of uh, uh, the, the premiums of the Cantillon effect and, and so on. Uh, so it's an early side of distortion. If you have monetary distortion, you can't count on competition. It gets even worse because, of course, you don't have a level playing field. You can talk all the much about le uh, level playing field. A new heuristic and a new structure enters, and that's what we see in venture capital and venture formation. Once you realize, that, of course, that the soundest kind of liquidity you want to go for is real productivity. Like you solve a problem for consumers, they're liking it, uh, they exchanging value in return, that's great. That's the sound basis that what we like about markets. But once you have a distorted monetary structure, of course, gradually, without people realizing it, this whole protocol gets distorted. Uh, and the liquidity that becomes important may be exit liquidity, like just finding new retail investors. Never mind if there's never any sustainable productivity Never mind if there's no real problem you're going to solve. Let's just figure out who are the idiots to sell our venture to. Or let's figure out how to get, how else get liquidity. A new credit line, a new investor, a new subsidy, um, and so on and so on. So of course, once that kind of liquidity, that interventionist liquidity becomes overwhelming, you can't claim that the competition for liquidity and the discipline of the market really leads to a weeding out uh, of uh, companies wasting resources. No, it can enhance and increase the amount of companies competing about new ways to waste our resources. Uh, and that's actually uh, uh, what's happening. Um, 
uh, I think, uh, I think a, a large part, not all of those, a large part of those 23,000 uh, cryptocurrency are actually nothing but regulatory arbitrage to compete for retail liquidity, posted on the thing that people want to save, of course, and they figure out, wow, Bitcoin was a big story, and if I missed it, I try to find something where I can be early again, uh, and you have the token instrument uh, that's a kind of pseudo equity without having any claim to any dividends uh, or any claim in any share of the business. Uh, uh, many of these uh, projects are really sound uh, ways to try to experiment with new technology, but they are in the different, in the wrong sector. It's like people being pushed into speculation by the interventionism, this, this destroying the monetary protocol that leads to an inflated need for new uh, uh, and the shiny uh, in order to find someone else who hasn't heard about it that you can exit to uh, and liquidate uh, it. And of course, with interest rate manipulation, it's uh, ever worse because it's ever further in the future where the potential productivity may lie and you have ever larger promises of utopian solutions which usually happen, don't happen that way. Technology usually doesn't happen that way that one uh, enterprise offers a protocol innovation that people understand immediately and then pay money for. Uh, usually it's a sector-wide change where uh, companies are riding waves of adoption and helping people bridge the gap to a new technology and helping figure out how you can use that uh, and uh, so on. And of course, money has the essential network effect uh, where more competition is not a good per se. And let me cite Hans Hoppe, who in 1990 uh, already wrote, the notion of competition between monies is a contradiction in adjecto. Strictly speaking, a monetary system with rival monies a freely fluctuating exchange rate is still a system of partial barter, riddled with the problem of requiring double coincidences of wants in order for some exchanges to take place. The existence of such a system is dysfunctional of the very purpose of money. Competitive monies are not the outcome of free market actions, but are invariably the result of coercion, of government-imposed obstacles placed in the path of rational economic conduct. Uh, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, it was a very prophetic uh, remark, I, I, I think, uh, in correcting uh, some of Hayek's approaches uh, uh, to competition, which goes a bit along the line that Rothbard already tried to correct, uh, that competition in the good sense can only be about access uh, to the market, privileged access, and the impossibility to access a new market or the impossibility to say no to a provider. That's the real crucial, dangerous kind of uh, monopoly. Uh, but it doesn't tell us anything about how a market should be structured and how many companies should be in which arbitrary industry. Uh, that's really um, uh, very, very uh, misleading. Um, now, let me uh, conclude. I, I think it's a flawed way to look at markets uh, this way. It's a globalized level playing field. I, I think it's uh, this idea, which has been popularized a bit in the US, that there is a sucker born every minute, and now we got to compete to kick the sucker into our goal and monetize him as quickly as possible because someone else will be there for the new sucker. Uh, so you call it like a sucker soccer. They're all competing and try to get the new sucker emerging. Um, and uh, I think that's the reasons why, that's one of the reasons why big corporations are becoming woke. And it's the reason they don't want to miss out on any sucker, no matter what is his, her, or their pronoun. They just got to catch every sucker possible. And that's this flawed idea of competition. It's like one size fits all thing for global audiences that, of course, are very colorful and diverse. But, uh, of course, just the diversity that's breached by certain gatekeepers uh, uh, that you orient yourself. Uh, so I think there's an intrinsic reason. I don't think it's that ideological. It's really about not losing any kind of sucker you could milk uh, uh, for your flawed business idea uh, in a distorted market. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to agree with Guido that uh, the, the uh, uh, the essence of the problem is a wrong dichotomy. 
That's the usual dichotomy between the market, the competitive market, and society and the state on the other side. And it's like why competition is, is, is this important field. This, of course, is the wrong line. We all learned from Rothbard what the real line is. There's coercion on the one side, and there's the market and society on the other side. And there's no reason to believe that there's more competitiveness in the non-coercive sector. Actually, my anecdotal experience is all the other way around. Uh, who are the, more, the most petty competitive people? They are in bureaucracies. They are in government-funded universities. I mean, who gets to teach which hours on which curriculum? He gets to get what certificate and what price? It's careerists. That's the kind of competition. Why career comes from Karos. That's the chariot in the race. That's exactly that. It's an arbitrary game, a rule. Someone has told you that you've got to make most money or got to have most acclaim or whatever. And then you're racing along and think, oh, you're very competitive uh, in doing that. And then my experience is you find that kind of career is usually in the distorted interventionist coercive structures. And it's really crazy to think that uh, it's like when, when scientists compete for third party grants, that's the market. It's like the third party grants usually are government subsidies, prices, uh, a credit, you, you name it. But if they cooperate, oh, that's a market failure because cooperation can only happen uh, in the sphere of government where they openly share their ideas, where they work on open source projects, for example. Well, it's crazy. And in particular in this industry, I'm a bit aware of the technological change mostly happens in the open source part. It's like people intrinsically motivated to try out something new, having leisure to not compete. That's actually one of the essences of invention, having the leisure not to be forced to run along with everyone else in a stupid red race because you are free to dissent, you are free to say no, you are free to discriminate and cooperate with anyone you like and not just take any sucker as a customer because that's supposedly, supposedly how the market is working. Thank you for your patience.